We, your petitioners, dwell in a land where merchants are noted for enterprise, whose manufacturers are very skillful and whose workmen are proverbial for their industry. The land itself is goodly, the soil rich and the temperature wholesome. It is abundantly furnished with the materials of commerce and trade. It has as numerous and convenient harbours. In facility of eternal communication, it exceeds all others. For three and twenty years, we have enjoyed a profound peace. Yet, with all these elements of national prosperity, and with every disposition and capacity to take advantage of them, we find ourselves overwhelmed with public and private suffering. We are bowed down under a load of taxes, which notwithstanding fall greatly short of the wants of our rulers. Our traders are trembling on the verge of bankruptcy. Our workmen are starving. Capital brings no profit and labour no remuneration. The workhouse is crowded and the manufactory is deserted. We have looked on every side. We have searched diligently in order to find the causes of our distress so sore and so long continued. We can find none in nature or in providence. Heaven has dealt graciously by the people, but the foolishness of our rulers has made the goodness of God of none effect. The energies of this mighty kingdom have been wasted in building up the power of selfish and ignorant men, and its resources squandered on their aggrandizement. The good of a party has been advanced to the sacrifice of the good of the nation. The few have governed for the interest of the few, while the interest of the many has been neglected or trampled upon. It was the fond expectation of people that a remedy for the greater part, if not the whole, of their grievances would be found in the Reform Act of 1832. They were taught to regard that act as a wise means to a worthy end, as the machinery of an improved legislation. They have been bitterly and basely deceived. The fruit which looks so fair to the eye has turned to dust and ashes when gathered. The Reform Act has effected a transfer of power from one dominating faction to another and left the people as helpless as before. Our slavery has been exchanged for an apprenticeship to liberty, which has aggravated the painful feeling of our social degradation by adding to it the sickening of still deferred hope. We come before your honourable house to tell you, with all humanity, that this state of things must not be permitted to continue that it cannot very long continue without very seriously endangering the stability of the throne and the peace of the kingdom. We tell your honourable house that the laws which made food dear and those which, by making money scarce, make labour cheap, must be abolished. That taxation must fall on property, not on industry. That the good of the many must be the sole study of the government. When the state calls for defenders, when it calls for money, no consideration of poverty or ignorance can be pleaded in refusal or delay of the call. Required, as we are, universally to support and obey the laws, nature and reason entitle us to demand that in the making of the laws, the universal voice shall be implicitly listened to. We perform the duties of free men. We must have the privileges of free men.